Today on The Right Key, my guest is the incredibly creative engineer and producer, Nick Hard. Nick's highly creative and unique audio stamp is now heard on multiple Grammy-winning records. This series was conducted in the spring of 2020 via Instagram, and the audio and video quality do reflect that format. However, the words and insights of these guests are still priceless. Nick Hard is one of the most sonically interesting engineers and producers around. His diverse credits include work with The Bravery, Jupiter One, Edison, The Kin, Aberdeen City, The Church, Wayne Krantz, Rudder, Fork, The Hunter Tones, Shannon Steele, Bill Lawrence, Dustin Stanton, Bo Conte, and most famously, multiple recordings, many, many, many recordings, including a lot of live recordings with Snarky Puppy. And one of these records that you recorded and mixed earned you a Grammy. Um, and you've had a number of careers prior to being an engineer, right? You weren't always an engineer. Before that, you came from DJing. And yeah, that was that was less of a career and more more of a hobby. Um, I, I started getting into electronic stuff in uh, in high school. And, but it, uh, it, it shaped your concept. Can you sure? Can, yeah. Can you talk about the scene? Uh, or at least the scene, how it felt to you in Philly and London, how they were different, and especially the London scene. Yeah, I mean, the, the, this kind of scene that I was involved in was just it was a lot of hard techno, actually. And uh, I mean, it was a lot of warehouses um, and a lot of late, late nights and long weekends. Um, yeah, I mean, ver versus Philly, which is more, more house parties and, and glow sticks and that kind of thing. But uh, yeah, it was the '90s. It was the late late '90s. Yeah, but that's, so, that uh, definitely it. Definitely played into your your awareness of music and concept and all that, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I basically through through going to clubs and sort of taking up DJing, I got in, interested in creating electronic music. Ended up buying a bunch of uh, you know synths and drum machines and stuff like that. And uh, I think learning Cubase was the first program that I used uh, and was using MIDI CV gate before that. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, definitely sort of having some more dancey sounds and, and certainly like the way I deal, I think with drums is probably more from an electronic standpoint than organic. Yeah. But they, then you came back to the U S and you were working as an engineer and you started working at RPM and eventually you became the chief there. Yeah. First, I, well, I, I, I was uh, an intern and then assistant engineer at Unique Recording. I don't know if you ever you ever went there. I remember Unique. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was an interesting, unique place. Um, yeah, it was, especially then. It was kind of, it was transitioning, <laughs> we'll say. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, but then ended up at RPM, which was an awesome, an awesome place. Um, you know, they just had so much, so much gear and... Uh, uh, because because it was such a small place, I ended up on a lot of sessions. And then when the the kid who was house engineer uh, before me, you know, this is probably like a year in, he quit and basically left. You know, that left me in, in responsible for all of the sessions that were coming in. Uh, so it was a good a good way to learn. And you were uh, you started to have a little more time to get creative with stuff? Or did you feel like that was more kind of meat and potatoes, cut your teeth, learn to engineer time? Definitely, definitely more the meat and potatoes cut my teeth. Um, there were definitely, um, like I said, it was this was after about a, a year, maybe not even a year of being an assistant engineer. Um, so I was sort of thrown into the, the fire probably a little bit earlier than I should have been, but because the owner was um, cheap, he uh, he he just sort of like threw me in there and made me do it um, rather than hiring an outside person who would have been more expensive. <laughs> yeah, but you but then obviously you earned the trust of of artists because you went, ended up going to Australia with the church, right? Was that yeah, it? so they I met them through through RPM. They came in um, and were working on a record, and they came in for uh, I'm not sure how I can't remember how long, but. Uh, you know, they came after that session, they came through town the following year on tour and they invited me to come to Australia um, for a couple months to, uh, to engineer a record with them. Uh, ended up being four months, um, but uh, yeah, it was cool. And were you working every day with them or were, what was the schedule like for that? 
I, I think this is a long time ago now. This is 2002. Um, Ancient. I think, I think, yeah, I think this, I think it was, I think we worked like five day weeks and then, and then there was, there was a few weeks off around Christmas, I think. Wow. But, uh, yeah, it was, it was definitely, it was definitely a good, a good learning experience too. And you came back, you came back to the U.S. after that or? Uh, yeah, was... yeah, I, re I returned to the U.S. And, and at that point um, I had quit, quit my job um, at RPM and so it was freelance. Um, and yeah, I've been sort of freelance since, since then uh, in the U.S. So, but, uh, but jobs you did before engineering, because I think this stuff is so interesting and it certainly, uh, it plays into your ability to look at acoustic spaces and build acoustic spaces. You worked in construction for a little while. Yeah. 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 I, I mean, basically, uh, originally I went, I went to Temple university for psych and pre-med and made it, uh, I think three days in, uh, before, <laughs> before, before, uh, leaving, leaving the class in the middle of the class. And, uh, I, I wasn't sure what I was going to do, um, but basically spent, I think it was like a year, about a year um, going from job to job. And so I did all, all kinds of different things, like working in a, in a pub in London. Um, but scaffolding um, was sort of where I ended up as the most, uh, spending the most time doing. Um, but yeah, all, all kinds of stuff, like working in the mailroom of a hospital, which is probably like the worst, the worst job I did. Well, but, uh, but you, but the construction thing, because you built your, you basically built your, your long time or long enough time mix room that you had on, Twenty uh, First Street. You built yeah. a, a room within a space. Yeah, um, I mean, I learned a lot of that stuff. I think just, I think sometimes as a, as a as an engineer, you can't help but learn. I did. There were there were a number of records that I did where it was just in somebody's space that they had you know, either in their house or in, in the back shed kind of thing and had to sort of figure things out and make things work with, you know, with uh, not quite ideal uh, situations. So I think a lot of that stuff just came through trial and error and experience um, with studio stuff. But I think that's one of the things that makes you such a flexible engineer is that you, you had to work in those spaces and now it makes you able to work in all those spaces because you were even mixing, I recall that you mixed, uh, I'm wearing my rudder shirt, by the way, because that's where we met. Yes. Yeah. Awesome. Tim, I was going to trade it. Tim here. Uh, Tim oh, go ahead, Timmy. And I think that Tim, Tim is the one who, who said we should really work with this guy, Nick Hard, because I've been working with him. And I don't remember if he had met you at RPM or. Yeah. Yeah. On, on, um, it was, it was a movie soundtrack. Um, I can't, I can't remember the name of the movie, but uh, it was like Analyze This, I think. Oh, Probably that, was Analyze something. This or Analyze yeah. That. Yeah, e either one. <laughs> yeah, Analyze This, Analyze That. Right. And yeah. uh, at RPM, and you met Tim, and then Tim said, we got to work with Nick Hart. I think it'd be really interesting. And it turned out to be really interesting. And I think the thing that, Analyze That, Tim says. Uh, and uh -huh. I think the thing that's uh, that's interesting about about you is your is your concept and I want to talk about your concept about sound because I think you have a mm -hmm. unique sound I think you have a sound that that people say oh that sounds like a Nick Hard mix you know mm -hmm. okay and and you developed a thing and and it's just especially with drums and the way rhythm section glues together I think it's very unique and uh, I'm wondering if you if you thought about that concept or if you had if there were seminal records that kind of inspired the way that you hear drums should be and, or if that came from electronic music or. Uh... Yeah, I mean, I think, I think a lot of the drum stuff does, um, you know, cer certainly early on came from, you know, my, my, uh, my time with electronic music and just having, you know, really heavy kick drum and, and just having the rhythm section be sort of hit, hit hard and be punchy. Um, de yeah, it definitely came from, from that, that, that era of, of music for me. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, I think it was sort of all based around that and then it's just sort of evolved a little bit. Um, but I can't say that it was intentional or, um, that there's any one specific thing, certainly that, that, 
sort of led me to to where it is now. But I think that I think that especially uh, in the mid two thousands, you were making records that didn't that nobody else had the record that sounded like that in a way. You know, when you were you were mixing records that had acoustic instruments, but they sort of had this hybrid feel to them, and they didn't yeah. feel like programming. And I thought that I thought that was so unique, and a lot of a bit more records sound like that now. But I would say that uh, you're to be credited for some of that sound. <laughs> it's really, when you started working with you know, when you started working with a band as as well known now as Snarky, then lots of people trying to sound like Snarky, and so people trying to mix like you mix. Uh huh. Yeah. What does that feel like? That's funny. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's true. I think it's true. Yeah, I mean, I guess it's it's. Uh, yeah, who know, I'm not sure. I th I think uh, it would be pretty. Uh, I feel like a lot of it is unintentional, and it's just sort of uh, uh, the decisions that I make are yeah, not they're not like conscious necessarily all the time. So it might be a little bit difficult to to do that. I mean, it's certainly not like about any one particular plugin or or. No, uh, no, and I see you change. I see you change equipment, you know, I see you change plugins and I'll say, are you not using this one? And oh yeah, I'm not really using that one anymore. And yeah. you know, it's on to something else and it's not necessarily because the other one is better, but maybe you got bored of the other one. <laughs> it, 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 there's, there's definitely an element of sort of getting a new toy and, and um, you know, having something visually interesting to look at that you haven't looked at for years. Um, sure. So, but yeah, there's not, not, yeah, not necessarily like sonic reasons for that. I'd say that's also evidence that it's not the, t it's not the gear, it's the ears and the application. I mean, that, that I've, I've said that for, for years and that you can, you know, you can make a, a great sounding record with a Mackie and 57s and that, yeah. uh, I, I really kind of like, I'm opposed to this whole like preaching about, um, specific bits of gear and like having to have certain things in order to make things as you know sound professional or a certain way um and that that uh you know it's it's yeah it's not about the equipment that you have uh for the most part but having said that i you know i end up in a lot of places where i get to use a lot of the good cool stuff <laughs> yeah sure sure i mean the cool stuff is fun but it's not a prerequisite right and it doesn't right. make it doesn't make inspiring music on its own Exactly. Exactly. There's it doesn't a, make you know, inspiring the, mixes. It, it it has to be operated, or it's just cool looking knobs and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Good for Instagram pictures. Totally. Totally. <laughs> totally. <laughs> and you also work. You like to work in. You work in, but I think you like to work in unconventional spaces. You like to record in unconventional spaces, and maybe that's because you were forced to when you were younger. Um, yeah. <clears throat> I mean. Yeah, I, I definitely do. Um, I'm actually I'm actually in the sort of process of of trying to do even more of that. Um, and one that's because it's possible now. It's it's you know we don't we wouldn't have to like lug in tape machines and a console into a space. So you know taking in a laptop and an interface is is totally doable. Um, and so because we can you know going into places like you know a church or going into you know, a huge um, concert hall and, and using these spaces that weren't equipped before uh, because we can, there's a little bit of a technical challenge to it as well. Um, and just sort of making making things work. Um, but also there's, there's you know, there's, there's a bunch of layers to it. One, um, certainly in terms of taking, like taking a, a band or an artist and doing a record in a house, <clears throat> whether it's their house or Airbnb, they end up being more, um, or they can be more comfortable um, you know, not having the pressure of like, uh, the studio clock ticking and, and the amount, you know, spending thousands of dollars a day on this thing. Um, it can be more relaxed, taking more time. You know, I'd rather have two full weeks in somebody's house than have, have like three days in a really well-equipped place. Right. So yeah. there's, there's, there's a few things that go into it. Um, yeah. And, and, uh, but also on the mixing side, I mean, on the tracking side, I, I've seen you experiment and like to, you know, if, if there's a luxury for it, you like to print extra tracks of creative things and, 
and be part of the creation process. And I think any smart producer or band should welcome that from somebody like you or like you for sure. And and when we've had the luxury, I think I've said to you, <laughs> hey, let's just go crazy. Let's get as weird as possible on this. Yeah. Um, I mean, during during tracking sessions, um, you know, if, if there's a, a an effect or something laying around, I'll usually have it hooked up one because it's it's you know makes me able to do more and have fun and do something, and that's you know once everything's sort of up and running and smooth, um, and two just just creatively, um, you know, it can end up inspiring different performances. Um, yeah, and 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 help you know a lot of the times I'm doing that stuff and it's in a rushed. Um, I'm sort of just doing it on the side as I sort of focus on the main sort of capture of the band or whatever, but doing this stuff on the side. And so you end up getting a lot of like happy accidents. Um, I think one of my favorite ones is actually on the fork record with the, um, the electronic cow in the silo bass sound. Um, <laughs> right. Was that on, on Melt? Um, I, I can't remember the name of the tune, but I, you know, um, you guys were all in the live room. And at some point during the take, I just, I had, you know, the assistant patch in a, 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 I think it was a spring reverb and it was coming back to the console just for monitoring and it was all distorted and completely fucked up, but it sounded amazing. And so, I, you know, I had him patch it into the thing and, and, you know, it ended up making it all the way through to the, the final. Yeah. And, you know, I know now um, Kevin, Kevin is replicating that um, sound with his, you know, a series of pedals and stuff. Yeah. When we started playing with Kevin, I said, "Hey, uh, can you try to, can you try to do this thing that we did on yeah. the record?" <laughs> yeah, the last time I heard it, it, was, it did a pretty good job. So yeah, was cool. yeah. But you, you know, you, I, I love this idea that you take things and kind of go nuts. And I know I've talked to other, other uh, people who've worked with you, and they said, "Yeah, you know, he does really amazing stuff with it." And and then sometimes we come back in the room and we're like, whoa, you went pretty far. I remember yeah. working with Mike League on something. It might have been Lucy Woodward's record. And you you said, what do you think? And you played it and both Mike and her were like. <laughs> <laughs> but but that, I mean, that's that's also like half the fun is like, I mean, all this stuff is is completely. Uh, um, what the hell's the word? I mean, it's it's there's so many possibilities for this stuff and like you know if um it is totally possible to go down a wrong or like a wrong avenue but i'd much rather do that and then like turn it off or not use it than 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 sort of be safe and not you know not explore the like creative possibilities that there are so it's it's i i, I definitely make a point of like not being too precious about these ideas because i know that some sometimes like i'm completely on on a different tangent and uh can go too far um and there's definitely there's definitely times where i will intentionally push it a little bit too far um knowing if, if i know somebody well enough and know knowing where they're going to want to pull back to um you know, rather than sort of st aiming for where I think they're going to be happy with it, sort of aiming beyond that so that when they sort of pull back a little bit, it's it's still a little bit more uh, fucked up than it would have been. Right, yeah. Well, well, I, I always love it, and I know that you're so flexible that you can go back and forth. Um, have you had situations where you've done that kind of thing and some, some client was really unhappy? <laughs> um... I don't know about I don't know about really unhappy. Um, uh, yeah, I, I I don't think anybody's ever gotten like really upset. I mean, there, there've been a, a couple instances of people definitely been like, sort of like you said, re recoiling a little bit and and stripping it, <laughs> stripping it back. Um, but I mean, I always do try to preface it with like, hey, check this out. Like it's it's you know it's it's easy to go back. You know, so it's not like these things are all necessarily uh, committed to. Um, right. There's definitely been there's definitely been a couple of moments, and it depends on the kind of person's personality where it might it might feel a little heavy. That that uh, like oh my god, I can't believe it sounds like that. But you know, when I show them in two seconds that it can go back to to, to normal, uh, it's fine. Do you ever work with uh, bands where there are disagreements in the band about how something should sound? 
Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. There's plenty, and uh, I see, I see that smirk on your face because uh, <laughs> you're, you're part we're of not, one of we're my... not gonna, We're not going to talk. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. No. There's, there's been there's been a lot of instances um, like that, and and you know, quite. I mean, fairly routinely. You know, it's 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 a pretty common thing for there to be disagreements, and and uh, you know, there's there was. Oh yeah, there's been some really funny, really funny things. I don't know how, <laughs> how much detail I should go into um, on on specifics, but yeah, there's been there's been some good ones. Um, but that, generalities, uh, and and do you do you? I mean, the, because part of your job is is to be in service of the music and to be in service of the clients and to kind of make people happy, happy and assured. And obviously, you want to get the best result, and you want to do something that feels musically good to everybody. Uh, how do you, how do you gauge those situations and how do you go forward and, and how much do you, um, just, yeah. The, I mean, the most, the most important thing for me in the, like in those moments is not letting the session get derailed. Cause there's been, there's been times where, where like sessions have gone derailed and people get pissed off and walk out and, and, and that kind of thing. And I think you know, not letting it get to that point. So there's, there's, you know, a few ways uh, of, of sort of have to keep things. I mean, I think arguments like that are actually healthy and good and creative. Um, and, you know, having one person always be able to put their foot down and say, this is the way it's going to be and override the thing isn't, isn't a great way to do it. And the, the discussion and, and stuff, as long as the discussion doesn't get too heated and emotional and, and ruin the session, um, so a lot of the times, I mean, when these things come up, I'll be like, "Hey guys, like, why don't we try both ways, you know?" And then we'll 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 see what, um, yeah, see what it looks like after yeah. and pick one. Um, and you know, a, a lot of the times, I'd say like ninety percent of the time, by the time we get to like mixing something or or you know hours down the road during a mix, it, the 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 whole situation sort of settles down and there's a, a resolution. Um, and, and it's, and it's either clear that there's one better way or, or somebody, uh, is like, oh yeah, you're right. So how do you, uh, here's a question about listening, about monitoring levels, because you, you monitor pretty quietly. And, I do now. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah. I think you, I think you have for as long as I've worked with you, which is going back quite a few years and, uh, and I think it's it's really smart, but it was kind of surprising to me when we first started working on stuff. And I, and I, how do you how do you reconcile that with clients who want to listen to things loudly? Do you leave the room so you don't blow your ears out, or do you, you know? Um. Yeah, I mean, I I, I sort of figured out, and this this some of this also comes down to like the the room that you're listening in as well, that that some rooms can handle volume and handle like more, you know, sound waves in the room than other rooms. And if, especially in smaller rooms, the louder that the music is, the less um, accurate the frequency response is. So listening sort of quietly gives you like a more balanced thing because there's more of just the direct sounds coming to you and um, you know, less buildup of frequencies and stuff. And, uh, you know, if, I mean, if if somebody wants to listen back loud, yeah, like I'll, I'll I may leave the control room because at, at that point I probably need a break anyway because uh, you know I've been sort of listening for hours. But that's the other thing is is you know ear fatigue is a pretty uh, a pretty real thing. Yeah. And uh, you know if you're listening really loudly um, for for hours on end, then your your perspective gets pretty pretty skewed. Um, but yeah, I think uh, probably at some point you you did a lot of reference listening for mixes. Do you still find yourself doing that? Like when you're going to a mix, do you listen to refs? Uh, do clients ask you to listen to refs, or do they come in uh, and say we want our record to sound like this? Um, there, there are yeah. I mean, occasionally it does depend on on some people but yeah sometimes they'll be like oh you know i like the snare drum sound in this song or like you know they'll they'll say that they'll, they'll give me a song or a handful of songs um to reference um you know sometimes i listen to that stuff and sometimes i don't um because some sometimes people's 
it depends on the client, but sometimes people will say that they like a mix on a song um, or a master on a song, and it's what it is actually that they like the song or they like something that's within the song, um, not as much the mix. So, so I take some of that stuff with a, with a grain of salt. And, um, but I'll, yeah, sometimes I'll listen to something and get, get inspired by you know, a sound or something that's within something. Um, I definitely reference if I'm working in a new place and I'm mixing, I definitely listen to stuff that I know and sort of reference just, um, yeah, records that I know really well so they become acclimatized to the room. Yeah, and then and then you take these mixes out of there and for the most part, if you've, if you've become acclimatized to the room, then you get the mix away and you feel like it's uh, it still transfers and it works. Yeah, yeah, hopefully. <laughs> Uh, and so, and then you go on to mastering, and and I wanted to ask you about mastering because you've worked with a lot of different mastering engineers, and I know you have opinions about mastering, which is you should. Uh, yeah. What do you expect or desire out of the master when it comes back from mastering? What do you expect a mastering engineer engineer to do and to not do? Yeah. So my 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 favorite like. Um benchmark or whatever for for great masters when i get it back and i um it sounds better than the mix but i don't know what he did um you know a lot of a lot of the times i'll get i'll get something back and be like oh yeah like it's a little bit brighter here and a little bit less low end and you know i'll be able to tell roughly like what what has happened to it um but there have been you know a few times where i get something back and it's like wow it sounds better and you can't quite put the finger on it so more like mystical shit that somebody's done um so that that i definitely uh i definitely like and as far as not doing things i mean um yeah i don't i don't really care as long as it sounds better um and uh yeah i mean you, you obviously don't want it to sound worse or like really crushed but uh yeah, this. I mean, as as far as the process to get there, it doesn't it doesn't matter as long as it is better. But mastering, so it's kind of elusive, and and I know that you've had experiences where where the master came back and it wasn't good, and that's got to be frustrating. And and uh, how do you handle that? I mean, I I look at it the same way as like we were talking about before. Like when I take effects and I go you know, in a direction that isn't what necessarily what the artist was thinking. This is another sort of step of like revision and it's not, you know, there have been a couple of times where I've done a series of revisions with a mastering engineer and then actually used somebody else um, where somebody didn't quite get there, but man, that's, it's very rare. And usually, usually through a, through a couple of revisions, you can kind of get, get to where it needs to be. Um, so it's not, it's not the end of the world. And I always think of mastering as like a kind of like a dark art. Um, and that I, I'm sort of relying on this mastering engineer to be a final set of ears on, on, you know, on the projects. And that's why I don't do that stuff myself. Um, but having a good relationship with, with a guy or a couple of guys, that you know, that, that, uh, understand what you do. And, um, you know, like Dave, Dave McNair is, um, been doing a lot of this stuff for me for the last few years and uh yeah we have a good working relationship and generally he knows um he's figured out what it is that we like and he sends stuff back yeah it's i mean he's great dave is phenomenal yeah. he's a great a great musical set of ears as well um so you i know there's documentation about this you took on all this live recording and mixing of snarky puppy and it was just a tremendous yeah. amount of work and a yeah. tremendous technical task to mix this stuff in a timely fashion how did you yeah. get those mixes working so that you could turn them out because i know mixing you know it takes time and you know how did you get that stuff turned out on a on a regular schedule yeah i mean it's been it's been a learning process for sure and it's still it's still far from uh far from perfect um you know when when we first started doing it they they you know the, uh started to be on tour and they would mail hard drives like once a week uh and this was from europe and so there was it ended up taking about two to three weeks to get 
the turnaround happening because I would wait a week and then the hard drive I would get would be from shows from last week. And then it would take me, you know, at least a week to get through that stuff. There were things like lost hard drives, um, you know, things getting stuck in customs. Uh, and so I think, I think, you know, after that, um, is when Mike suggested that like going on tour with them. Um, and so we sort of, you know, figured out that with Dante, we could record, you know, split from all the mics. Um, that first, I think, six weeks tour in Europe I did, there were so many problems um, with, you know, and just stuff that you wouldn't expect that you come across. Um, but the idea is that basically having a template, um, which is, is also like grown over the, the, the tours um, and, and just getting into a, a workflow. Um, but it's definitely like an evolving process. Um, and you know, an hour, it's an hour and a half of music basically every every night, and and treating it as if it's a studio record. Yeah. Um, so th there is a certain amount of just sort of like having to sort of blow through things really quickly, in order to get it done. Um, there was a period where where Mike wanted to listen, and you know, make make some mix changes before it got printed and sent off, which just sort of timing wise, you know, meant that because this was all being done overnight and listen in the morning and that would push the, you know, push the release back until like the late afternoon. And, um, it just sort of, so we've had to sort of strip things away like that. And, and, uh, you know, and then also get more, more people involved. So the, the production manager on the tour is now the one that uploads the stuff and the live sound guys actually put sort of, uh, put up the extra mics and stuff, uh, rather than one person doing all of that stuff. Yeah. That's helpful. That's very helpful. Yeah, for sure. Um, but they still sound like you. Those mixes still sound like you. It's that's very much to your credit. Um, that's interesting. I think so. I mean, they still sound like your sound. Yeah. And, uh, are are there records that now you're hearing from other people where you say, "Wow, that's a really interesting sounding record," and and I, I think that's a really. Are you seeing people doing new stuff with engineering that that's catching your ear and feeling like, "Well, that's new space and that's new." new concepts about this? Um, not especially. I mean, if out of, out of anything, I'd say maybe some of the, the actually more electronic stuff is, is, is doing stuff like that. I think actually you, you might've shown me this like years ago, actually this, uh, what was it? Cubris. That's just, I mean, I don't, music, um, I don't know if it's music exactly, but it's like sonic, a bunch of noise. I think um, I see some Yoke and Rooker, maybe. Uh huh. Uh, yeah. yeah. Anyway, it's just like really, really bizarre use of sounds, and and um, I think in in the electronic world is actually where a lot of like the innovation is is happening, um, and and yeah, the more the more interesting stuff. Is Nick Lamar says, "Otek Otekra." Uh huh which is um yeah what is that is that that's a that's another a band? Artist. yeah 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 um but it is i mean as far as like band band stuff there isn't it's there's definitely like a limit to what you can um sort of do and still have it represent the the instrument and uh uh going back to this idea of of mixing in in unique spaces and working remotely now you're you're obviously still working there and you're still mixing from there and working on projects now in this time not being in the same room with clients and how's that been and how's that communication process uh, it's, I, it's 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 cool i mean uh, for for um, I did, did a session yesterday with, uh, via Skype and then I have a, a live stream from, from, uh, you know, from Pro Tools so that I can, you know, make more or less real time mix revisions. So it's, it's slightly slower in terms of communication. It's not quite as easy as turning somebody and talking to them, but, uh, it definitely, uh, is, it's, it's almost as good as being in a room with somebody. Um, the time difference is a little weird um for for a lot of my clients here in the u.s um but uh it's it's cool man i mean with with things like sonar works um which is room calibration thing you know i'm set up right now in a in a, a room with like glass walls and stuff and it it you know with with the sonar works thing it 
kind of, uh, it, it helps it to sound almost like it's treated um, and sort of compensate for some of those weirdnesses. But uh, I mean, my goal is just to be completely sort of independent of, of having to have these sort of spaces that are so uh, sacred and, um, you know, sort of built up and be reliant completely upon that. Because at the end of the day, people are listening to music in all kinds of different rooms and and whatnot. And it's more about just being being comfortable and knowing how to adjust myself rather than the room. Yes, in fact, in February, I saw you mixing a record on a boat. <laughs> That's right, yeah. In the Caribbean. That, un unfortunately, I didn't have speakers for that. Um, but that's that's the goal, is to, to just be mixing from a sailboat in the British Virgin Islands. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and that record came out well, and the client was happy. and, and uh, Yeah. That's the thing. And it's kind of like the gear um, thing you were saying before about like the, the equipment doesn't really matter as long as you know how to use it. And, and um, you know, in, in that instance, I was using headphones that I know pretty well. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that is, you know, that, that helps me to get the job done. And using plugins, doing everything in the box was absolutely fine for that. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and, and you're doing some really interesting stuff with, with recent records that are, uh, I would say transitional records for some artists, especially this record you did with Becca, Wonder mm. Moon. It sounds really fantastic and really modern. And, uh, and the drums are interesting and super modern sounding. And was that a combination of, of treating drums and, and uh, some layers of things? Or how did you achieve what you've got there? That, um, I think, I think with the exception of one tune, it is all organically played drum, drum set. There's no like drum machine or loop things that are in there. Um, it was all Jordan Pearlson. Um, we had in total two, two different sort of sessions, uh, but we had four days at Mission in Brooklyn. And uh, really with every song, we we took time to basically disassemble and reassemble a new kit out of what what suited what we thought was going to suit the suit the song and i mean we you know a very intense drum session because it was only about the drums and there, there are like 11 different kits there so we just sort of frankenstein together tried out different things if it wasn't working we didn't use it um on on that record there are some songs that have like three or four different drum kits during the song depending on the section um and and things like that, and really just sort of took the time to get good, good sounds. And if we needed to do just kick and snare, and then cymbals separately, we would do that. Sometimes, other times it was a full kit. Um, but yeah, we sort of really went to town, um, which was a, a lot of fun. Yeah, I, I think Jordan, Jordan had a good time. That you're uh, you're definitely of the school, and you were saying I, I was seeing and in another interview, you were saying that you like to commit things like EQ to tape the yeah. recording and uh, start shaping early rather than leaving things sort of open and unequued when you're tracking. Y yeah, totally. I, I'm, and, and in that drum session was definitely doing a lot of that and, you know, a lot of, a lot of EQ and compression and, and trying to get the sound. So, some of that is from, from the sort of the tape days because basically you wanted to get the sound on tape as hot as possible without it distorting um, so that when you were mixing it, you wouldn't have to do any of the EQ because if you started like raising top end on something, you'd bring up the noise for the tape machine. So you, you sort of went for it like that. Um, so there's a little bit of that, but then also I just find that people, um, you know, when they have great stuff in their headphones, they, they play better. Um, so if the, if the headphone mix is sounding good or warm, or if they come back into the room to listen and it sounds closer to the mix, is going to end up sounding they get more inspired um and it's more fun for me because i get to twiddle some knobs <laughs> right uh i saw a question that flew by earlier nick little morgan asked uh what role do you think modern mixers play in production additional or otherwise um i think i think that depends on the the mixer um and i think that there there are a couple of different kinds of guys there there are definitely mixers who strictly you know strictly mixing um 
that will just sort of take what you've recorded and, and piece it together and make it sound, you know, pristine and amazing. Um, and then I think I might fall into the other category of people that like to fuck with things. And there's been loads of times where I'll, where I'll switch, switch things off and just like take the drums out. Um, you know, definitely not my place to do that, but I'll make the suggestion. Um, so right. definitely for me, I mean, this is actually um, how I started getting hired as a producer because I was, I was just a mixer come, coming out of, uh, you know, when I was freelance and I was with that band Aberdeen City. Uh, I mixed an EP for them. And then I think like a year later they came to me and they asked me to produce because during the mixing of that EP I'd been doing things like that and sort of doing more of the sort of producer approach to the mixing. Yeah, and uh, and talking about that thing about switching mics off or or switching or isolating individual mics, I remember something you did with a with a live DVD that we had from Rudder from I don't know like 40, yeah. 50, 60 years ago. That's what it feels like now. Uh, but we made it a live recording and and you ended up focusing on the announce mic, which was otherwise not used. Uh -huh, so because it's an song. ambient. Is, so what's that? Stuff, but it was like on the stage it wasn't far enough away for it to really be an amb it wasn't really serving as an ambient mic but you somehow made that part of the drum sound and it really changed the life of the record yeah i, d I don't specifically remember it but that does sound like something that uh that i would do because uh i mean yeah that's that's the the um in in mixing it's for me the goal is to sort of uh emotionally make the song sit in a place um that is sort of eliciting kind of the response that that relates to the song um and so like in a live situation like if everything is just a close a close tight mic um it's not going to sound live and it's not going to be sort of feel like the environment that the people were in at the time Right. Um, that's why in the, all those live recordings, I, tr I try to have at least two ambient mics, if not more. But I guess yeah, in that instance, there wasn't one, so that's I had to use that. I read that with the snarky recordings, you you requested quite a few ambient mics or audience mics. At least you try to as much as possible. Yeah, yeah, and I, I'd actually like to take it even a little bit more, um, if in in future, if if possible. Um, there have been, two, yeah, just two mics back, either by front of house or on the stage. Um, but I'd actually like to get, yeah, at least at least four up at all times, if not maybe a decatry or something, just yeah. fun. You hear that, Jamie? Just, you know, get out the checkbook. More yeah. Here. Well, it, it actually doesn't cost anything except time. Because we've got, <laughs> we've got all the mics and stuff. It's just about about having somebody set them up and and take the, the, the time and the care and attention to do it. Um, right. But uh, yeah, a lot of that's just to help avoid like hearing that singular conversation from the dude in the front row talking to his girlfriend. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, we'll see. So uh, I want to ask a question that's I, I've been sort of avoiding talking about <clears throat> people being in in quarantine and I'm trying to not uh -huh. make these videos too much about about what's going on now so that they could might feel timeless later. But um, I will ask because all these musicians are sitting at home now making little videos of themselves and jamming and some of it's just to share and then some of it's meant for long time collaboration, uh, yes. longer term collaboration. Can you, is there any general advice that you have for musicians or general mistakes that you see that could be corrected? People uh, getting their first gear and trying to record themselves and trying to make things right yeah i mean i the i mean i think the, the the first thing is i think this stuff will be usable and and will be good to to record and so they're, therefore using a real microphone and sort of multi-tracking even if it is just a, a thing like this but having a real microphone hooked up and recording it onto a, a laptop um you know in full full resolution rather than using your iphone microphone um, is a good idea and you can do it simultaneously. It doesn't, you know, you don't have to be sort of wired all together, but uh, you know, getting good captures on this stuff um, is, I think is cool. And then send, you know, we can then send, if you record something and send it to somebody and then they can put their bit on it, even if it's tied into video. Um, 
But yeah, but, and, and there's just, you know, just basic recording techniques that don't have to do anything fancy, uh, but just really just getting a microphone on whatever instrument it is. Um, you know, there, there is some stuff that you can do with treating rooms and um, what, what not, but really at the end of the day, like if it's, a, if it's the difference between sort of being like, oh, well, I don't have like any of this equipment, so I'm not gonna do it um, versus just sort of doing it in whatever way you can. I definitely think that, you know, people should be tracking as much. And this is like an amazing time to be making records because we don't have anything better to do. <laughs> <laughs> That's for sure. Although it all has to be alone. Are you using, a, are you using a audio? There are a couple different plugins that are people using, people are using to output with their DAWs and such. Uh, I think you referenced one of them and Teddy Kumpel mentioned another one. Mm -hmm. So the, the thing that I've been doing for the sort of remote listening um, sessions is a thing called Audio Movers. Audio Movers, um, right. yeah. Yeah, which, which um, I, I just started using it um, before I had a whole other situation set up that was a bit more complicated. But this is like a plugin that you put on. People are able to listen in. Um, theoretically, I could record you. You could, you know, send me a transmission, and it can do like really high quality. I don't know if the um, bandwidth here would be strong enough. Um, and I've been, I've been sort of looking into, um, you know, some of these options. There's a company called Source Elements that, that you know, I think, I think primarily they were in the world of VOs, and so you know, doing doing live VO sessions. Uh, from one side of the country to the other. Um, I don't know that there's any real practical online thing for multiple musicians to record together in time. <laughs> yeah. um, I haven't, I haven't seen that yet. That but, doesn't uh, exist. And my, my software engineer friends tell me that that's not going to be possible because of too many points of latency, even yeah. even in our houses, you know? Yeah, no, it's, it's, it, it'd be, it'd be really weird. I mean, you know, maybe eventually down the road, but uh, yeah, everybody might have to have the same, the same box or whatnot. Right. But uh, for now, you know, I think, I think the best thing that people can do is just like, you know, record onto their laptop and then send it to the next person kind of thing and then have them overdub it, which, I mean, that's not that drastically different than, than making records for some people. Um, you know, a lot of the times we'll do, I'll do one thing at a time in the studio and it's not always full band in a room kind of situation. You know, you sort of do the drums and the bass and then the guitars and then, you know, keys and vocals. So it's, it's not wildly different, um, except not being in the same room as somebody to keep them on track. Right, right. Okay, well, uh, I only have one more question for you, unless you want to add something else before I ask that question. And uh, no. <laughs> okay, so this last question is it's a little esoteric, but mm. it's actually a two part question. Is there a Nick Hard album coming? Uh not to my knowledge. Not, okay. not that I... If there was yeah. a Nick Hard album coming, what do you think that would sound like? Um that's a very good question. Um I I have no idea. Um there's there's been no plans to to do that um despite some people uh, I did I did make an arrangement with with Becca Stevens actually that that I would write a song. Um haven't haven't quite gotten there. Um but I came up with the idea for it and it's a it's a country tune. Oh nice. Um, but uh called called I'm, I I ain't the sharpest tool in the shed. Um <laughs> But other than that, I have absolutely no plans for an album. I mean, what, uh, so if you, but that, I guess that question is more about what would you most like the Nick Hart album to sound like? Um, uh, that's a good question. I, I, I really haven't spent a lot of time with it, um, with, with, with thinking about that. Um, well, this is a wonderful time, you know? Yeah. <laughs> well, oddly enough, I'm pretty, uh, got, got uh, a decent amount of work on. Um, but yeah, because I don't really play any instruments and I don't sing at all, um, it might be, I'd say it'd probably be an instrumental, <laughs> an instrumental record. I think of, that's of a lot of really spacey shit. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think you should make the record really spacey shit. I know a lot of people would like to collaborate. 
the yeah. Arts Records spacey shit. But it's mostly <laughs> just a rhetorical question. So uh, yeah. thank you so much for joining me today. Um, cool. Really interesting. And if anybody wants to reach out to Nick Hard, nickhard.com, N-I-C-H-A-R-D, and he will mix your shit and make it sound fantastic and unique. Cool, man. Thanks a lot, Nick. Thanks, Henry. Take Go care, get man. more coffee. Have a good day. All right. All right, later. Thanks for joining me for this episode of The Right Key. If you enjoyed the episode, there's a lot more coming. Please click the subscribe and like buttons below. If you want to know more about me or our guests, you can find lots of information in the link just below the video. See you next time.